projects that everybody's engaged in are amazing. They're so important. Um, this history and this work, well, I come to it through history. I know everybody's not necessarily doing history, but the history and the work is really critical, especially in this moment. So thank you to everybody who is engaged on it and the LDA, LDL for existing as a repository for um, the, the research that we, we need to be doing in this moment. Um, it, uh, sorry, first and foremost, um, links to various things, citations and, and, and whatnot <laughs> are all available at this site. If um, this QR code will pop up in other places, it's the same QR code. If you've already clicked it once, you don't have to click it again. Um, but in the Zoom world, there used to be kind of a citation site at the end of presentations. In the Zoom world, the Zoom kind of just clicks off. So I've taken to adding a QR code where people can actually access the links and, and other kinds of uh, articles, books, and things that I'm mentioning. Um, so just keep that in mind. I would be remiss as a scholar of early Louisiana who's invested in black life and in Africans in the Gulf Coast and Africans broadly across the diaspora if I did not acknowledge um, the work of Winnemago Middle Hall. Hall's work is the way that I came into even thinking about history and also the history of, of, of this region um, and was somebody that was able to know and actually know in real life when I was a faculty member at Michigan State University. Um, and this was um, the one on the right is an interview, me inter being able to interview her on behalf of the Midlow Center in one of her um, later moments, um, just this last June in Mexico. So um, just want to, as always, acknowledge her um, and her presence in this work, particularly the history work, analog history work, but also the digital work, which I think is really important to remember. Um, I want to also, um, oh no, this link is not showing. Hopefully other Instagram links show. There was a really beautiful altar created. Um, uh, Kathy Hamburg is here, was also part of that at the Midlow Center that was in, you can see a little, little arrow there if you have lightning eyes. And <laughs> I couldn't see that if I was sitting there at you, but. Um, for some reason, it's not showing. Don't worry about it. Um, but uh, there was a beautiful altar made in her honor at the Midlow Center, which I believe is down now. Um, but um, just a testament to oh, there it goes. Testament to the kind of um, impact that she um, she had. Um, and uh, it's also important as a guide for thinking about digital work and thinking about doing DH. How I describe doing DH against enclosure, but hopefully we can begin to think of as just doing DH. Um, uh, it's important, I think, to kind of hear maybe a little bit in her own words, um, you know, what some of that might mean. So when you're, you know, one of the things that is, that I really love about the database um, is that it is really complex. You know, like you when, you, when you were planning it, when your team did it, everybody who was involved, you didn't shy away from making category after category after category for race. Yeah, can you, why, why did you decide to do that? Because it seems like, you know, people kind of want to scale things down and make them really simple or have only so many categories, but this database is, is rich. Like it has all of the different listings, which is great. Yeah. That's the first one that dealt with slaves. Like the, the transatlantic slave trade database really didn't have even any, any fields. Even if somebody found information about slaves on the ship, there wasn't any room to put it. So that mine was the first one that dealt with slaves as people, as individuals. So I try and play that as, as often as I can, not just because of her passing, but because I think it's really important when we're thinking about genealogies and citational practices of how we're doing digital work broadly, um, that we think about where some of the interventions first occurred, where people were even early on, and as a woman in a world of science and tech, the only one um, often in the room, um, you know, like how can we sort of, you know, also learn from these kind of past, um, these past moments and past scenarios. Um, so a little bit, uh, I come to this thing that is, is described as humanities, um, in some ways as a black studies for a few different projects. I don't come to it through the academy. And I try and make sure I set that out because my priorities in doing DH work, what is now described as DH work, are not necessarily the same as academic priorities. So I come to it through radical media, through digital media, through radical women of color blogging, the folks who are organizing around radical justice and transformative justice. 
um, and doing it through expansive conceptions of what media is. So media as zines, media as pins, media as t-shirts. Um, so doing that work with African Aspire PhD, Black Negros Project, and what and Thayer Electric Baronage, which won the Garfinkel Prize in Digital Humanities from the American Studies Association, was that's where my formative spaces were. So it's a particular kind of accountability and a particular kind of um, a sense of why we're here and why we're doing this work that is very much about what does it mean to be against enclosure. Um, part of this is, ha ha ha, that S is just kind of got lazy. Take a nap. Um, part of this work is also about thinking about um, getting into kind of that granular level of what is happening with the digital in our infrastructure, in our code, and what now we're often describing as metadata, like the fields, the frames, all of those things, and thinking about those as part of how we're thinking about digital, about black life in, in general. Um, so that it's not just kind of like, here are black people, value added, insert them and spin and stir, that it's actually about, actually we need to be thinking about this from the very, very, very bottom up, from our very assumptions about what the digital is. And so um, this is a special issue of uh, the, black, um, the black scholar that me and Mark Anthony Neal did around this calling of black code studies. Um, since then, um, in 2020, um, in the midst of COVID and in part in response to all the things that were swimming around as a result of pandemic and protests, um, me and Christina Thomas, um, who is now Dr. Thomas um, and who I'll be hooding next week, I'm very excited, um, founded Life Code Digital Humanities Against Enclosure, Grammar Refusal and a Language of Freedom for Digital Humanities. And we created it to be very, very specifically about thinking about DH and for folks who are doing DH projects, but who really explicitly wanted to do it in a context of thinking about anti-racist thought, anti-racist work, decolonial work, and, and integrate that and really move from that space as opposed to sort of think about it after they were doing their projects. Since 2020, this is the most recent map um, and visualization of all of our labs um, and all of our projects. So we have labs, we've got micro labs projects, as well as, um, for some reason this cuts off at the bottom, but that's okay. Um, what is in blue, now we're beginning to build bridges across projects. Um, and so Black Vernacular is our latest bridge. And I'm, again, I'm happy to talk about anything here uh, you know, uh, probably in the in the Q and A, all the Life Code Labs, um, again going with that anti um, anti racist and decolonial um, you know vision from the ground up and alignment from the ground up, have to follow these principles. So um, there are some ways of thinking about how to do DH in the academy that are about where are projects situated in relationship to libraries, to centers, to departments, and whatever else. And I'm happy to talk about that. This is an initiative in which we have said, you can do DH elsewhere in the, in the institution or in your institution, because we actually are a cross pan institutional initiative, outfit, collection of labs. But if you're gonna be in life code, these are the principles that you align yourself with. So it's not forcing anybody to be aligned with these principles, but if you are in these, if you, in order to do their work, but if you wanna do your work over here, this is what you're, what you're agreeing to sign on to. Now these principles are guided by the loophole of retreat, um, among other things, but one of the things we were especially guided by, um, me and Christina when we founded it, was the loophole of retreat, um, which was an exhibit and a symposium and a gathering in 2019 at the Guggenheim Museum with Sadia Hartman, Tina Camp, and Simone Lee. Since then, there's been a second loophole of retreat at the Venice Biennale, where Simone Lee, who is a sculpture artist and just an amazing, just an artist in general, she's pictured at the bottom, um, was the first African American woman um, to have a featured pavilion. So she she did her exhibit. Um, her installation at the U.S. Pavilion. It's the first time that's ever happened. Rashida Brambe, who's pictured above, is the curator of a larger event that happened around that. This is Sovereignty, which is the, um, the pavilion that um, Simone Lee um, uh, curated, and, and, and the inside is amazing. If you know anything about the U.S. Pavilion, it doesn't normally look like this. Simone Lee redid the entire thing, basically recreated the U.S. to basically be, you know, born out of African women, which I think is fascinating. And then they made this song. We took a week to action, <laughs> took a week to battle. We, 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 we in the water. We. It meant to get off the path we. to wait in the water in order to cover their scent from bloodhounds. Traditional European spatial temporal consciousness saw time as flow and inevitability. So one of the things that Rashida Bombre um, curated around this, and these videos are great because I know I talk really fast, so it forces me to stop. Um, 
one of the things that Rashida Bombray curated around that exhibit was this event, the Loophole of Retreat in Venice, which had new keywords. So if you look at our about page, we've got it by like five principles. They added new ones for us, yay. <laughs> they didn't do it for us, but we imagine that like, yes, now we have new principles for another five years of life code. Um, and invited a whole host of black artists, curators, scholars, some of whom I've followed for a long time, who I believe are also at the intersection of blackness and the digital and digital humanities and art, like black quantum futurism. So I definitely want to make sure that they are here. So one of the things that, um, you know, I, this keynote gave me an opportunity to think through, like, you know, beyond the about page of principles, what are some sort of guiding practices of thinking about doing DH against enclosure? Like if I have to say to somebody, here is how you do it, what might you say? And so, first of all, this is foundational for me. The digital is rooted in histories of African diaspora, black study, and slavery as an operating system. So what does that mean? One of the things that um, you know, I turn to often, particularly in recent years since it was published, but in general because Jennifer Morgan's work is so foundational, is the book that was, um, I think, 2021, Reckoning with Slavery, Gender, Kinship, and Capitalism in the Early Black Atlantic. And one of the things that Morgan is setting out there is that there are some key ways of even thinking about relationships, about markets, about, um, about uh, demography, about how we use numbers, basically computational humanities as it's described today, that emerge because of slavery and the slave trade. Um, one of those, um, so that's one side. The other side is that, and this is from folks like Medusa Parham, who is um, the director of the Immersive Reality Lab and also director of Adhume at University of Maryland, is that thinking about the digital and black life, again, is not value added, you just shake and stir and add black people. It's about thinking about what is descriptive and generative about African American experiences of memory, space, and time that can actually reshape how we're thinking about digital tools, infrastructure code, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll come back to Marissa Parham in just, um, in just a moment. So a little bit about the theory. Morgan, in thinking about this early period of population studies, of demography, of numeracy, and how these things are being generated out of um, the British Empire, essentially, because she's focused on the British Empire in the 17th century, is noting that this is happening at the same time that there is an increased investment in overseas colonies and slave trading. So one of the things that she's talking about and trying to trace is that in the same time that there's this kind of key interest in markets and adding a kind of uh, reality to something like paper that now becomes money or something like coin that now become something like gold and now becomes a coin and now has a marker and a value added to it that has to have a surety it has to have a confidence it has to be a thing that translates across global markets that all of this is happening because you have a massive transit and the shaping of a global market, and that market is the slave trade. Um, so she's talking about the ways that there's a new conception of what the economy meant, markets, commodities, currency, and that African culture, bodies, and labor are used to try and think about, A, what is not stable, what is seen as tradition, what is seen as savage and unmarkable, but also what are the actual bodies that are needing to be commodified and needing to be um, given a value number so that people can make money off of it. So she's trying to draw all of these ties into literally the way we're understanding population, demography, currency, um, and markets themselves. She's basically giving us a new, new origin story for the, for the founding of capitalism. Um, so that is one of the kind of guiding principles that I think is really, really important when we're talking about anything digital. Another one is that, let's say we don't go with the origin story and we have arguments about Morgan and she's wrong, she's not wrong, but like let's say we pretend that we know more than her. We still also have to reckon with the ways that the slave trade itself creates a whole series of tools that we now take for granted as the best mechanism for doing business, for computation, for accounting, and more. So Caitlin Rodenthal is another scholar that I think is really important to think with in um, thinking about the emergence in the 18th and 19th century of printed instructional material, an economy, a business, a profession that created the ledger book, the register, the printed document, because these things were handwritten for a while, the printers who made a business, who were created and formed around making material like this in order to organize the information that is African bodies in the slave trade. The circulation of forms, books, and magazines all contributed to the spread of plantation accounting practices. And what does the form then do to how we understand how numbers operate? How do we understand how enslaved people are supposed to exist in this world and therefore how we understand what black life is meant to do? 
So if demography, population studies, censuses, like spreadsheets, the database exists because of slavery, then we could think of slavery's archive as, uh, of data as really kind of structured, A, by anti-black violence, but also as structuring everything we understand about the digital humanities. I know, that's a big argument, but we could talk about it. We could actually, actually step there and sort of sit with that and think about what is our spreadsheet sort of based on? Weird. So that's one. The second one is, what does it mean then to confront black people as data? And here is where, um, I was actually just reading, just rereading Barbara Christian, um, who is a, a famous, prominent black feminist scholar. He wrote a beautiful essay that I come back to often called The Race for Theory. And one of the things she writes about in her book, Black Feminist Critique, is that critics also need to be writers, also need to be readers. Um, so uh, have taken um, up as a principle that, you know, if we're going to critique the digital, we should actually also try and do something about it. So one of the projects that um, I am co-PI on um, with Kim Gallen and Alexandra White is a project called Black Beyond Data. This is a Mellon-funded project that um, began as a computational humanities and social sciences research lab and is now, as we describe it, an ecosystem of projects, labs, scholars, and folks who are trying to think more deeply about blackness and its relationship to data. Um, so these are my three co-PIs. Um, it started as three projects, COVID Black, the Black Press Research Collective, the Risk and Racism Project, and then of course you see here Life Code. And now the ecosystem looks like this. Um, so we have three um, key pillars, medical data, which is the one um, Dr. Sasha White is um, focused on and thinking about what does it mean to really Think about um, white fragility in medicine, or what does it mean to think about um, what is what where black people show up in medical statistics, often in death or in illness. These questions have especially have emerged around COVID and the kind of conversations around black morbidities, comorbidities. Um, the other pillar is community data, where we work with um, community organizations that I'll describe in a second. And the third one is the one that um, I'm especially keen on is um, slavery and data, and what does it mean to kind of rethink our relationship between histories of slavery and thinking about computational humanities and data. Everybody still with me? All right. <laughs> So we've got the Black Beyond Data Greeting Group as one of our projects. This will also pop up again in the fall. So if you can, lifexcode.substack.com is where you can always find out more information about any of our projects. But that's also where we send out updates about that. Um, and so, as I mentioned, community data, um, the community data arm of this is actually really, really key and important. Across all Life Code projects, one of the things we started to take um, is not sort of an original principle, but is a thing that we've just, just recommitted to over and over, um, is um, a community engagement. So engagement with community, engagement with descendants, and I'll talk more about that. Um, that's something that pretty much all of our projects have some relationship to. So with Black Beyond Data, we have a relationship with the St. Francis Neighborhood Center where the community data project exists, where they're looking at what does it mean for the community, and this is West Baltimore, um, a predominantly black community, um, what does it mean for black people within their community to have an ownership of the data that's being circulated around them? Um, so this has been a very, so one of the things that's happening out of there under um, Lauren Rubin is training community members to be data stewards and to have control, have an understanding of what data is getting collected about the community and then be, you know, stewards of thinking through what does that mean for the community itself. Um, another community organization that we're working with is New Generation Scholars, um, which is, um, building courses and um, projects and exhibits around, uh, let's see, this is, no, it doesn't have a, I don't think it has a video, um, around African diaspora scholarship and research. And as full disclosure, I am their African diaspora teacher, which is how they came into this project. And so they work with um, youth 15 to 22 um, in Baltimore, black youth in Baltimore, um, and um, around African diaspora education. <laughs> Um, the third community organization that we're working with is African Diaspora Alliance, um, which you see here. Actually, this is not just African Diaspora Alliance, it's New Generation Scholars and Afro Charities. Afro Newspaper is the oldest black newspaper in Baltimore. I think it might be the oldest black newspaper. 
who was the first one? They argue they are the first one founded. Um, and so this is our trip to Chicago, where they visited the Chicago Defender, the Sabo Museum, and a whole host of other folks, um, and also had a, um, had a dance class, among other things. So this kind of work that we're is also considering part of data. <laughs> that if we're doing digital work, if we're working in cahoots with community, A, we have sound, we have music, we have dance, and that all of this is, a, is part of how we're learning to think about data, how we're learning about our relationship to the digital and to technology. Um, and I just want to shout out Kim Gallon, who's really been truly foundational in a lot of this work. Um, her conception of black and relationship to being beyond data is that thinking seriously about black life adds the humanity to how we're understanding what data is. That you cannot have a digital humanities without understanding blackness and its relationship to life, not just to death. So the third point. Um, speculate, create, play, and imagine otherwise. This is a really key piece, as you can see in the last few slides, um, about how the relationship to um, the digital operates in actual black communities in the present day. That engagement with things like social media, digital media, although a lot of that is being reshaped by things from AI to Elon Musk. Um, are also about what is enjoyable, what is pleasurable. And there was a note, I think um, SK was talking about pleasure earlier. That's actually incredibly important to the engagement with the digital. If the site isn't aesthetically pleasing, if the site is not, a, a, if the site isn't usable and navigable, that's one thing. But if it's a joy to navigate, if there's a way of connecting to the site that is effective and a pleasurable affect, people are going to use it, people are going to engage in it. Um, and so um, to come back to Marissa Parham, one of the ways that she talks about using the digital and thinking about the digital um, is to think about how can we use it to play even in the space of mourning. So this was an exhibit that she did on her Instagram out of a project called Breakdance that was around the, um, her grief around um, uh, Toni Morrison, um, Toni Morrison's passing. Um, and this is another one who I won't click because I should have prepped the, um, the, the video before um, that was part of a, a digital art exhibit called Material Conditions that um, Immersive Reality Lab hosted um, as well. But this, she also did post a clip from it um, on, her, on her Instagram. So there are a lot of ways also of engaging with the digital that if we're thinking about our projects, we cannot sort of see as sort of side aspect of the project. If we're thinking about also a commitment to black communities and their engagement, we actually have to think about those as we are thinking about other things in the project, which is why one of the things, one of the kind of first roots that Life Code had in thinking about um, its engagement with the digital was um, in thinking about uh, you know, how the digital, particularly blogging, media, um, the aesthetic can be part of the enjoyment of academic work, essentially. So this is Study Electric Marinage, one of the first um, projects that be, you know, became part of Life Code, collaboration with myself and Dr. Jomaira Figueroa at Michigan State University. Um, these were our electricians um, who were all graduate students at either one of our institutions. Um, for graduate students of color, particularly black and Latina um, graduate students, life in graduate school trying to figure out how to navigate projects that are about radical and transformative justice is incredibly hard. Um, and so this also became an opportunity to create a, create a community around this. And so they hosted events, they brought us suggestions, they had people they wanted to see and they wanted to talk to that were part of their research. Um, and so we made that happen. Since then, Electric Maronage has continued. Um, Jada Simulton is currently the editor there, and they are doing um, amazing projects and work. Um, not just, uh, so we keep also kind of an archive of, of everything that's already happened. Um, this is actually Christina K. Robinson has an exhibit for, of Maria um, uh, de Capita um, from Temple of, of Color and Sound. Um, but they're also continuing to solicit more materials. So it's become a kind of editorial space as well, a publishing space, not just a space that um, you can abscond to, which is um, kind of amazing growth for this project. This was founded in 2019. Fourth, community accountability, small and grassroots, slow and intentional work is the only work worth doing. I very, very much believe this. One of my, um, in an essay elsewhere, um, I talk about the ways that DH, as is conceived both in media and in the tech world, because um, once upon a time, there was no HuffPost or CNN.com. I'm old enough to know that. <laughs> um, there is that world of digital public highly financed, capitalized life. And then there's also the world of digital humanities and academia, which is also um, financed by foundations and grants and universities. And yes, the universities don't give us enough money, this is true. However, there's still money there. 
somewhere in between, there are also people who are like, I just kind of want to have a blog, or I have this data set, I want to make sure I share it with descendants, or, 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 or. Um, and that work is usually very rooted in accountability and community, and is also the work that, that um, I am keen on supporting and being in, in conversation with, particularly when it comes from um, students and researchers and community members who are interested in that. Um, so through Electromaronage, we've been able to kind of have the that kind of community connection. The thing we would always be trying, in some senses, uh, to get people to understand that this didn't just happen to me. This happened to everybody all at one time. So that what you do in a crisis is turn to your family, friends, community. But we were all in this same situation. Um, and I think that that experience that we had together um, is something that it's obviously something that's heavy for all of us, but I do think as we head into a really sort of uncertain future, I do think that we learn something together, like really profound, like in whatever way that we experienced that disaster, there's some, there's a blueprint for the bottom falling out that we experienced. So that's uh, Christina K. Robinson, um, who is um, artist, editor, and curator um, based in New Orleans. Um, and you see Sierra Chenier of no, um, Noir and Nola um, is in the back. So this space of electric maronage and these other projects also became opportunities to have these conversations out loud platform. Christina, of course, is talking about um, experience of Black New Orleans um, and, um, and Katrina. Um, we also have had partnerships with Vessels Performance, um, which uh, was co-created by Ron Nega and um, Rebecca Moisse. Uh, and we are also doing that um, and have been able to kind of use some of those connections um, and be part of those connections and scale up a little bit. So one of our major projects right now, the NHPRC funded project called Keywords for Black Louisiana. Um, so this is a collective of researchers. Um, they are creating, we are creating a digital documentary edition, translating and transcribing French and Spanish records um, from the Gulf Coast. Um, they're, right now we're focused on records that are based in Louisiana, based in New Orleans, but they are Louisiana wide. Um, and the doc, digital documentary edition will include the transcriptions, the translations, some annotations, and some other information, including keywords um, that allow us to, you know, basically build a kind of metadata that can connect the user, the individual, the learner, the scholar, to the documentation in a way that centers black life. And for anybody who wants to have a conversation about metadata and subject headings and centering black life, I welcome that for sure. The documents right now that we're using are at Louisiana Colonial, um, Louisiana Historical Center's Louisiana Colonial doc, uh, digitization, Documents Digitization Project <laughs> at the New Orleans Jazz Museum. Um, and so they have digitized the documents already. That was a project that was started. I think Erin Kitchen was, was part of the folks behind it, um, Brianna Sch um, Schneider. Um, and since then, um, they have been accessible. We are using those documents in partnership with them, um, but creating a, a, a digital documentation centered on black experiences and black keywords. Um, so one of the things um, that we are, you know, use Airtable, for example, as a tool in order to create a table, a data set, a set of tables um, that have information, um, metadata about each of these set of documents, um, but that also in adds to the metadata that's already at the Louisiana Colonial um, Document Center. Um, so things like names of black individuals who are in the documents or indigenous individuals, which are not always um, marked or not marked as thoroughly as, as, um, as others. Keywords um, that can describe and index black life. So fugitivity, marinage, wellness, care, play, as well as information about what kind of document it is. All of these things, um, these things are, are part of this air table. Um, and we have an expansive team. Um, uh, Dr. Eva Bayham is actually um, here in the back and here with us today. Dr. Kathy Hamburg is also in our advisory, um, advisory board, the community council. Um, and this team spans, speaking of collaboration, Tulane, Dillard, Xavier, um, as well as University of Chicago, University of Notre Dame, um, the Ecole um, des Etudes in France, um, Johns Hopkins, of course, 
Sheridan Libraries, et cetera, et cetera. So this is our current map of the core team as of spring 2023. Um, one of the things that was really key and even in the very beginning of the conception of this project was building in funding in the NHPRC planning grant, which is where we started. We just applied for implementation um, for summer workshops because one of the things we knew immediately was that we wanted to have community engagement, have community members, the Senate communities in particular, involved in every single step of this project um, in a way that was not going to be a burden, but in a way that we could be informed from the ground up about um, community work. Um, this is visiting the historic New Orleans collection. Um, and so it's important um, to think about like descended conversation. Descended is actually a word that has a definition that's developed out of conversations with, um, um, out of uh, actually a crisis that happened at Montpellier um, Plantation um, in the last couple of years. Um, a descended community can include those whose ancestors were enslaved, not only at a particular site, but also throughout the surrounding region, reflecting the fact that family ties often cross plantation boundaries. So there now actually are guidelines for what a descended community is and a rubric for engaging descended communities. And that rubric was set out by the descendants of um, Montpellier um, Plantation in Virginia, um, and that is also linked in that um, in that same same QR code. So we're so it's not just like oh we think we want to kind of broadly black people, although that is actually very important, and we're very much um, have a, you know have an expansive de definition of black, knowing Louisiana's um, expansive definitions of blackness. But we're actually very keen that there be a connection to descendant communities here, but also black public historians, black historians who have been working on this long before we ever came along and so that they also have a prime place in how this um, project operates. And just here are some pictures. So on the left, I just want to point out Dr. Janet Smith is at Delhi University. We were at Sorkin Wellness Collection just walking around and as we passed this picture, Dr. Smith was like, oh, that's my ancestor. That's my great grandfather. <laughs> and so we stopped. And so that's, but that's how visceral and how intimate the connections are. They just are just there swimming around in the air. Um, and so one of the things we want to do in doing this work is, is remain attuned to it. Middle picture is us at the Louisiana Historical Center looking at documents. Um, on the right is Mr. Leon Waters of Hidden History Tours who gave us a tour. Um, um, I think maybe the oldest running black history tour, um, tour guide and tour company. Um, uh, as we see, we have Dr. Kathy Hambrick telling us, walking us around uh, Dawsonville and, and um, giving us a tour of the River Road Museum and their different campuses. Um, and Dr. Bam at the um, Whitney Plantation um, site and exhibit for the 1811 Slave Revolt. Yola Dance, um, who is an amazing descendant expert and black historian at, at Howard University, um, giving a primer on descendant communities. And on the right, so we have many partnerships. One of the um, bubbles in that first Life Code picture is the Open Curriculum for New Orleans Culture. On the right is Rachel Brulin of the Neighborhood Story Project and Brian Wagner, who's over the Open Curriculum, um, who are also, um, who didn't stay, but because um, the, the workshop was, was um, centering black public um, historians, um, but they come and talk about the Neighborhood Story Project and talk about, and come be in kinship and solidarity that way. So here's just some photos from you can see Mona Lisa Saloy, Louisiana Poet Laureate there on the right, Sharon Roberts of Xavier University. So it's just um, really amazing um, community that's being built. And, um, and so that's an example of like, okay, this was slow work, took years, took lots of conversation, but became fruitful in the sense that when the opportunity for an NHPRC grant came, we could jump on it, we could apply for it, and we can begin to kind of like really continue to build bonds with the communities around us. Um, also along these literally same lines, the Diaspora Solidarities Lab, um, co-PI'd with me and Dr. Jemaida Figueroa. Um, this is literally built on the idea that these are the principles. Um, it's about the community work, it's about black feminist work, and it's about working in cross-diasporic solidarities. Um, so we have various pillars, um, we have um, community work that we're doing. We've got um, building that we're doing, including mentoring and, um, and access. We've got development um, as far as exec team, and um, now we have seed labs, labs that have gotten big enough that they're not gonna kind of go off and be independent with their own director. And then in the cream and in the green, you have our sort of two islands of scholarly research, which is focused around solidarity fellows who range, undergraduates, graduate students, community members, Postdocs and assistant professors are all, all count as solidarity fellows. They're all operating in various labs. The Open Boat Lab is run by Dr. Figueroa. The Community Knowledge Lab is run by myself. Um, the Community Knowledge Lab, again, kind of brings into fruition, into focus that community engagement piece. All of the labs are supposed to have some community engagement, some, some specific you know, interaction and, and relationality, um, and they're all doing some kind of um, research, digital projects, um, et cetera, et cetera. And these are just um, some, you know, 
what you call it, some swag from our various things that we've been up to. So with Black Louisiana History Incubators is partnering with Louisiana Museum of African American History in New Orleans to translate the Union, the first black uh, daily newspaper. Um, we had a um, author's event with Dama Llanos Figueroa who wrote um, an Afro-Puerto Rican novel, Women of Endurance. We've had scholars like Marisa Fuentes come, um, as well as Cydia Hartman, to talk about Hartman's trilogy. We had our um, we had a conversation with the music group EBE. Um, we are partnering among we have part, a whole host of partners, including the Black School in the Treme um, in New Orleans, which are going to be hosting our um, New Orleans Rememory Lab, our summer lab, our week long lab, which will be in 2024. Um, and then we also like each other. So this is us on the left, <laughs> Diana Taraguas, as well as um, uh, folks from Create Caribbean, which is a digital, um, the first um, DH center in the Caribbean, founded in Dominica. Um, in the middle, we um, it's uh, um, folks from Diana Taraguas, no Open Boat Lab at the Puerto Rican Studies Association. On the right, our students, um, Jemaya Davis and Leah Cohen from um, Xavier, who did some WPA research um, with the Keywords Project. Um, top left is Archipelagos of Marinage, which are the ones who are working with Open Curriculum New Orleans Culture on um, a story map on geographies of reproduction and runaway, um, Louisiana runaway slave ads. Um, and then, you know, just us hanging out, launches, like part of the building is also like building and bonding um, and doing it in a kind of intentional way. And that doesn't mean, to go to the fifth point, that every, we're always getting it right. We're often getting it wrong. Um, it means that we're committed to learning and committed to figuring it out. So the fifth one is about generosity, it's about patience, it's about never a failure, always a lesson. What is the lesson learned? Don't think about it as a failure. What is it as a challenge and what is the lesson learned? But also, again, this goes right back full circle to where I come from as far as thinking about digital media and coming out of radical men of color organizing. This is not about academic principles. It's not about having a deliverable. It is, however, about a high standard, a low barrier of entry and a high standard of conduct, which is, um, Oh gosh, I'm gonna I'm blanking her name. One of the um, the singers in um, the the group uh, formerly known as Climbing Poetry. Um, it's one of the um, organizing principles that they talk about. It, we have to have a low standard of entry, um, so that as many folks can get in as they can. But we do have to hold each other accountable to a high high standard of conduct. And that's not in a policing way, but that's in a like we are showing up. We're gonna commit to the collaboration. We're gonna commit to if we make mistakes, fessing up, being vulnerable, collab, um, like showing up for the the collaboration. In sense of like doing the work, being patient with each other, um, and that's a high standard of conduct. And we have found that it is it's very difficult, but at the end of the day, it is incredibly fruitful and incredibly worth it. Um, that's what I'm up to. That's what the H Against Enclosure is. Thank you. <laughs>